Hey everyone, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Kari and today I'm going to be talking about a book that I just finished reading and I have to talk to you about it because it has become a top five favorite book of all time. And if you've seen the thumbnail, you already know that that's The Goldfinch by Donna Tartt. This book has just consumed my whole life for like the past week and I just need to talk about it. So how about we talk about The Goldfinch? So first I just want to give you a little bit of information about how I even decided to read The Goldfinch. And it really started with the fact that I read The Secret History by Donna Tartt back in 2021 and that became my all time favorite book of all time, like number one favorite book is The Secret History for me. I love The Secret History. Like if you look behind me, I have the first copy of The Secret History that I read. So this has my first time reading annotations in this copy. And I have this copy that I read again and I did serious annotations in this one, like studious annotations about themes and analyzing quotes and everything. So that's what this copy is. It's the, I mean, it's the exact same. <laughs> thing is this one. This is just my first time impressions and this is my second time impression. Then I have this first edition copy of The Secret History, which is really, really cool because it has this like clear cellophane cover on it, which like dust jacket on it, which is really, really cool because I mean, obviously I have to have a first edition of my favorite book of all time, right? But not only do I have one copy of a first edition, I got a second one. And the reason that I have two of these is that obviously I bought both of these secondhand because I wasn't reading The Secret History in 1993 when it was published, but one of these has a few pen marks inside of it, which I didn't know because I bought them online secondhand. And so I ended up buying another one that it doesn't have any marks inside. I'm just keeping both of them because I love this book. And then I also have this Penguin version of The Secret History as well. And of course I got this 30th anniversary edition that just came out last year to celebrate the 30th anniversary of The Secret History, which this is a really nice copy as well. So that's my whole Secret History collection. So as you can see, I'm obsessed with The Secret History. I love The Secret History. It's one of my favorite books of all time. So I've really been like squirreling away the goldfinch and the little friend because I've been so nervous to read them because of how much I love the secret history. I felt like I was really going to love these two books and I just kept putting it off because you know Donna Tartt she's only published these three novels and there's been about 10 years between each of the publications of these books so it's like I felt like I really had to cherish the fact that I still had these two books of hers to read because I just knew I was going to love them and so if I read them then I don't have that excitement to look forward to reading them anymore if that makes sense it's, it's completely stupid it, it doesn't make sense but you know what I mean but then when I was trying to plan what are the 24 books that I want to prioritize in 2024 I said to myself you know why am I stopping myself from having the pleasure of reading more Donna Tart? like this is ridiculous why are you not reading these books like you know you're going to love them read them you know what I mean so I put on my list that I wanted to read either The Goldfinch or The Little Friend and so obviously as you can tell I just decided to read The Goldfinch and let me tell you Donna Donatar did not let me down. This book was an absolute masterpiece and I want to talk about why I loved it so much and why I think it's just such a great book. Like the plotting, the writing especially, oh my god Donatar's writing, and just as a whole why this book was so good for me that it shot to my top five favorite books of all time. Don't worry this is going to be a completely spoiler free review so no worries if you haven't read it yet. I'm not going to spoil the book for you. So first let's talk a little bit about what this book is even about. Well it follows a 13 year old boy who lives in New York City. His name is Theo and right from the beginning of the book we understand that he lives with his single mom and he's not in contact with his dad and where we jump into the story we understand that Theo has gotten in trouble at school and him and his mom are going to have to go into school to have a discussion with the principal so Theo's not at school this day because they have an appointment with the principal later on in the school day to go talk about why he's gotten in trouble and so him and his mom have a little bit of time to kill before this appointment so as the reader we know that Theo is hoping that his mom will take him out to breakfast before this appointment but as they're walking down the street in New York City it really starts to downpour like this rain is torrential and right across the street is the Metropolitan Museum of Art and so Theo and his mom take refuge in the museum while it's raining to kill time before their appointment and right from the opening scene in the museum we understand how important art is to Theo's mom she's referencing all these different paintings that she's loved throughout her whole life and her appreciation particularly for Dutch art and we see how Theo just really admires this love that his mom has for the art and how his love for art is really developing thanks to her however when they're really close to finishing the visit of the museum they're really close to the gift shop Theo's mom decides that she needs to run back and have one more look at this painting that she loves like she's like I, you just stay here I'll be right back I just want to go have one more look at this painting you know I love this painting so much I'm just gonna go have one more look at it I'll be right back 
just wait for me. But then, unfortunately, the unthinkable happens. There's a terrorist attack at the museum. As a reader, we don't see any of the terrorism happening because we're only from the point of view of Theo, that the attack happens in another gallery, but the effects of the attack are felt throughout the entire museum. And so the book jumps to Theo waking up after this terrorist attack, and that's where the book really begins. And so really everything that I just said about the terrorist attack and everything, that's absolutely not a spoiler. It's literally the first, I don't know, 15, 20 pages of the book probably. It's really the setup of everything that's to come because like I said the beginning really lays the foundation for the love that Theo has for his mom the admiration and the spark of a love of art that she instilled in him because after this terrorist attack we find out that his mom did not survive and actually Theo is one of the very few people who did survive the attack because once we jump to that moment of Theo waking up after the attack we see him try to figure out you know where am I what was I doing oh yeah I was visiting the museum with my mom how can I get out of here I need to go find my mom we always said that if there was an accident we would always meet up at home so so I'm going, to, I'm going to try to go home to because I imagine she's there waiting for me. She's probably wondering where I am. I don't know how long I've been here. I'm sure she's at home waiting for me. So we see Theo trying to get out of the museum. But as Theo is trying to figure out how to get out of the museum in this rubble after the terrorist attack, Theo stumbles upon this man who's really on the verge of death. Like he's really holding on for dear life. Like he's almost dead. And because of this interaction that Theo has with this man that's about to die, Theo decides to take, steal, <laughs> this painting called the goldfinch so obviously this painting really does exist they even put it on the inside flap of the book so you can see the entire thing because obviously here you can only see uh, the bird itself but theo decides to take this painting after this interaction that he has with this man who he's never met in his entire life who's about to die and so that scenario is what kicks off the entire book i would definitely say that the goldfinch is a buildings roman it's a coming of age story because we really follow theo through so many different life stages and him living with the effects of losing his mom at such a young age and having such a non non-existent relationship with his dad because obviously we have to follow Theo coming to terms with the fact that his mom is dead and what's going to happen to him now is he going to have to go live with his dad who he does not talk to does he go live with his grandparents the parents of his dad which he has no contact with the grandparents were never kind to him does he go live with one of his friends is he going to go into child protective services like what's going to happen to him so this whole book is really just following him through the different stages of growing up and who's going to be taking care of him and continue continuously coping of that loss of his mom, but also at the same time developing this huge attachment to this painting that he took from the museum after the terrorist attack, because it's the one thing that ties him still to his mom, even if he gets tossed around living with different people and everything, this is the one thing that keeps him attached to his mom. And it's just a really powerful story for many different reasons that I want to get into. So because Theo really doesn't have any family that he's close to anymore, the theme of found family is a huge one in this book. Theo is constantly trying to find connections to people that he can be close to because he lost his number one relationship with his mom like that was the most important relationship to him and so throughout the whole book we see him constantly grasping for a new relationship to find that love and connection somewhere else and we see him struggle through that that it's really difficult for him to find these relationships but once he does find those relationships we see how meaningful they are to him and how much power they hold over him and we really see how that tragedy can bring people together in really unexpected ways and Another really big theme, obviously because of the through line of this painting that he stole from the museum, is the role and importance of art in life. It really speaks to how art can mean something different for every single person who looks at it. If there's one painting, it can say something different to every single person who looks at it and mean something so powerful for certain people. There's a really great line in the book that I think sums this theme up perfectly, where they say, if a painting really works down in your heart and changes the way you see and think and feel, you don't think, oh, I love this picture because it's universal. I love this painting because it speaks to all mankind. That's not the reason anyone loves a piece of art. It's a secret whisper from an alleyway. Psst, you. Hey, kid. Yes, you. 400 years before us, 400 years after we're gone, it'll never strike anybody the same way. And the great majority of people, it'll never strike in any deep way at all. But a really great painting is fluid enough to work its way into the mind and heart through all kinds of different angles in ways that are unique and very particular. Yours, yours. I was painted for you. 
Like, I just think that sums it up perfectly, that Donut's art perfectly illustrates what art can do, how art can move you, that this one piece of art can change the way you think forever, and you feel like it was made just for you, that no one else can understand this piece as well as you do, that you connect on it in a completely different level than everybody else, and she does that so well in this book. It's so powerful. Even works of art that were created 400 years ago, they can still speak to us today. And in 400 years, they will speak to people in a completely new and unique way that art itself is the only constant in life. Another really big theme of this book, I would say, is obsession, which that's a theme that I really enjoy in books. And so I really appreciated that because throughout the story, we see how Theo gets obsessed with many different things. He, We see him obsessed with the painting of the goldfinch. We see him obsessed over a woman that's kind of unrequited love. We see him obsessed over some things that he really shouldn't be getting into and is really quite dangerous, but he's so taken with it that he can't help himself. And also, of course, obsessed with the memory of his mother and keeping the memory of his mother alive. And I would say one of the biggest themes of this story also is that how one moment can change your life forever. And you can never go back to how things were before that precise moment. Obviously in this book, that moment is the terrorist attack in the museum when he loses his mom. Everything changes for Theo. Nothing is the same. Literally nothing is the same for him afterwards. And throughout the whole story, you think how things would have been different for him if his mom had never died. And that's what makes some of the things that happen to him later so tragic is that you know these things wouldn't have happened if his mom had survived the attack. And kind of in that same vein, something that I really, really enjoyed about this book is the epic scale of it. It's so vast in its storytelling. Like Theo is constantly moving around. Obviously the story starts in New York City, but it takes us across the US, it takes us to Europe, it takes us back to New York City again, and just the scope of the story is so impressive and it's so believable. It really feels like Donna Tartt knows these places and can perfectly depict them to make you feel like you're there and you feel like that Theo really is experiencing the natural life in these different places. It just feels really authentic and the scale of it feels so impressive because not only is he moving all over the place, like I said at the beginning, this is a buildings Roman, it's a coming of age story. We see him not only only moving physically but moving emotionally and in his maturity and seeing the evolution of the different things that he's struggling with in his life and all of those things coming together it really makes you feel the epicness of the story another thing that's really great about this book is that we know that Theo takes the painting right at the beginning of the book right and obviously he shouldn't have done that that's not his painting right and so we see the guilt and the difficult situations that he gets put into because he has this painting but what's really cool something that I really really appreciated that I really love the way that Donatar did this is that the painting kind of just flits in and out of the story. At times, you're really preoccupied with the painting. Theo gets really stressed out about it sometimes, becomes really obsessed with it at other times, but it's not always present in the story. It kind of fades to the background sometimes. And then something will happen in the story and you're like, oh fuck, the painting, the painting. Like Donatar doesn't bring it to your mind, but something happens in the story where you're like, what is he gonna do about that, you know? And I just think it's really, really well done that it's just come in and out of the story. That it, it needs to stay in the back of your mind like, oh yeah, the painting. How is this going to fit with the whole problem of him having the painting? And if this happens, what happens with that? And it's just, <laughs> I'm gushing now. <laughs> She just does such a good job of that and constantly keeps you on your toes. And because the painting keeps flitting in and out of the story, it's really like the guiding light of the whole story. It's the through line of the story that even though it's not always present, it's what's pushing us forward in the book. So that's really all I have to say about the plot because like I said, I don't want to spoil anything, but now I really want to talk about the writing. Let me just say, Donna Tart can fucking write. She can fucking write. Oh my God, this woman can write. Obviously I knew that after The Secret History, that's something that I absolutely love about The Secret History is her writing. It's not just all the plot that I love about The Secret History, it's the writing that just captivated me and that's 1000% present in this book. It's kind of difficult to explain. You just get lost in the writing. It's so beautiful and she just knows how to describe things to make you get lost in the story. I would be reading pages and pages and pages and time would just fly by and it felt like a few minutes had flown by because I was just lost in the writing. It just felt like I was there. It didn't feel like I was reading. It just felt like I was experiencing it. Does that make sense? Have you, has that ever happened to you? I was just completely lost in the story because of how well everything was described and not just that things were described well, it's just the beauty of it. She's so good at doing similes and metaphors that are just so 
accurate and poignant and just beautiful. I don't know how else to describe it other than beautiful. The imagery is just perfection. You can perfectly imagine in your mind what's happening. And a lot of times when people say that something has beautiful writing, other people will say, oh, it seems so forced, it seems so fake. You know, they're trying too hard in the writing. That's absolutely not the case in this book. It feels so authentic. It flows perfectly. It doesn't feel forced at all. It's so authentic. That's really the only word I can think of to describe it. It's authentically beautiful and lyrical. And when certain scenes are happening, maybe at the surface, like if you were to explain a particular scene, what's happening in a scene, you can't convey in your own words how much it hurts your heart to read it because the scene itself maybe doesn't sound like a particularly powerful scene. Like it doesn't sound emotional, but the way that she writes it, there were times my heart literally hurt. I literally, <laughs> my chest would tighten up and it hurt to read what was happening, even though it would be like such a small scene, the way that she described it made it so much more powerful and so emotionally all encompassing that I just felt it in my chest, in my heart. It was incredible. Even during these, maybe what some people would call mundane scenes, it's just heart wrenching. It's incredible. She's a genius. Can you tell that I think she's a genius? <laughs> and so because of all of these things that I've just explained, this book is just truly unput downable. It's quite long. I mean, it's eight. 864 pages. That's a long book, but I could not put this book down. The pacing is just perfect because kind of like I said, the painting flits in and out of the story. It's kind of similar in the pacing that sometimes things will slow down for Theo in his life and things seem calm, but then uh, don't get too comfortable because something's coming and something's going to come and disturb everything. And you're like, oh my God, what's going to happen? I need to know what's going to happen. And then things will settle down for him, but then uh, something's happening that you didn't expect to happen. And now, oh my God, how is he going to manage this? It's just perfect. So obviously even from the non-spoiler plot points that I was able to talk about, you can tell that this is quite a, a sad book at times and there are even more sad things that happen throughout the book. So after I finished reading this book, I went on Goodreads and I read some reviews and some people were saying that this book is nihilistic. Basically that Donna Tartt is trying to send the message that life is meaningless, nothing really matters in life, and everything's just overall negative. But I quite disagree with this because, you know, in life, in real life, negative things happen, sad things happen that's life. But that doesn't mean that life is meaningless, that life isn't worth living. And I think at the end of this book, yes, all these terrible things have happened, but in the end, it's hopeful. That overall, there is a hopeful message in it all. And so I just really wanted to add that if you've ever heard that this is nihilistic, I really don't agree with that at all. I do think that overall, this is a hopeful story. So like I said at the beginning of this video, The Secret History is my number one favorite book of all time and something that I loved in this book, that there's a little nod to The Secret History fans because at one point there's a man called Mr. Abernathy, Francis Abernathy, you know, okay, from The Secret History. And the first time that that name is mentioned, they just say Mr. Abernathy. But then later in the book, they mention Mr. Abernathy again. It's just some random character, like it's not somebody important to the plot, but they mention Mr. Abernathy again. And just in the sentence after that, they say something about a Francis in the same sentence as this Mr. Abernathy. And I'm like, I see you, Donna Tart. I see you. Also, if you've read The Secret History, you know the famous line, beauty is terror. And again, Donna Tart makes a little nod to us secret history dorks out there. And at one point she says, the pursuit of pure beauty is a trap, a fast track to bitterness and sorrow. That beauty has to be wedded to something more meaningful. That's exactly what she says in The Secret History, that beauty is terror and whatever we call beautiful, we quiver before it. Like those two ideas go hand in hand. And I just love the little nod to us Donna Tart nerds who would pick up on that. So I really appreciated that. Also something interesting that happened while I was reading this was that the Women's Prize for Nonfiction announced its first ever long list. And there's a book on there called Thunderclap. And it's actually about the artist of the goldfinch, this painting, the painting obviously really exists. And something that's really interesting about this book is that Theo sometimes talks about the artist of the painting. And so you get a little bit of background information about, I think you pronounce it Fabricius is the artist. And this book that was long listed for the Women's Prize for Nonfiction is about that artist because that artist, he actually died in an explosion the same year that he painted the goldfinch. And obviously this book follows Theo who survives an explosion and his mom dies in the explosion. So I'd really like to do more research into Donna Tartt's inspiration for specifically choosing the goldfinch as the work that Theo steals because maybe there's some kind of connection there that the artist that died in that explosion and so, you know, there's some kind of link there. And so Theo steals that painting because, you know, he experiences an explosion. I think that'd be really interesting. I actually 
actually just started reading this book yesterday because I, I just think it's perfect to read right after reading The Goldfinch. I mean, what are the odds? This book was published over 10 years ago. And then as soon as I start reading it, this book is long listed about the artist. I just love that. I, I had to read it. So I just started that yesterday. And so like I said, this book was published over 10 years ago. It was published in 2013. And The Little Friend is the book that came out before The Goldfinch, which came out in 2002. So there were 11 years between The Little Friend and The Goldfinch. And then the book that came before The Little Friend was The Secret History, which was published in 1992. And so obviously there's 10 years between 1992 and 2002. And those are her only three books. So there's about 10 years between each of her books. And this came out in 2013. It's 2024. Donna, new book when? I would literally die. I would be deceased if she announced her new book this year. I would, I, I, I don't know if I could focus on anything else in my life if she came out with her new book this year. I really hope it happens. I mean, she has 30 years of precedence, right? That just about every 10 years she comes out with a book. I mean, don't let us down, Donna. So there is a movie adaptation of this book that came out in 2019. I've never seen it before and I've only heard bad things about it. So I think unfortunately I'm gonna have to pass on watching the adaptation just because of how attached I am to this book. I don't want the movie to sully any thoughts that I have about this book. I just want to have the image that I created of this book in my mind and I don't want it to be influenced by anything else, especially if it's bad. Like, I, I've really only heard bad things about it. If you've watched it and you thought it was good, I mean, you can let me know if you thought it was good, but if you thought it was bad, also let me know that because I don't know, I just don't think it's worth the risk. Honestly, I don't, I don't wanna risk it. You know what I mean? Unless I really hear a change of heart that lots of people who have read the book, watched the movie and thought that the movie was good, then maybe I'd consider it. I don't know. It would be a hard sell. So anyway, yeah, I, I don't have plans to watch the movie adaptation, unfortunately. So because I love this book so much, you guessed it, I went and bought a first edition hardback as well. I just had to have a copy of it because, I mean, this paperback was nice to, to read just so I could throw it around, you know, and put my notes in it, put my annotations and everything in it. But I would like to have this really nice first edition copy of it. Also, the spine is really nice. So yeah, of course I had to buy one of these to join my collection of Donna books, my Donna shrine, if you will. But I actually already had this anniversary edition of the Goldfinch. I got this last Last year, at the end of last year, Waterstones uh, was selling this book. They're, they're still selling it. I did pre-order the signed edition. I'm not sure if they still have any more of the signed editions in stock, but they definitely are still selling this book because it matches the secret history version. So obviously at the end of last year, I hadn't read The Goldfinch yet. I didn't know how much I was going to love it, but I'm so glad that I pre-ordered this book without having any indication of how much I was going to love it because now I'm so happy that I have this edition to join my other editions of The Goldfinch. I'm just really going to cherish this because, you know, the queen signed it. There are some signed editions of The Secret History and they run for so much fucking money. <laughs> They're so expensive. I would love to have a signed edition of The Secret History, but that is not in my budget. So I think that that's all that I wanted to tell you. Thank you so much for listening to me gush about my new top five favorite book of all time. I'm just so happy that I read this and that I loved it so much. It's just truly incredible. Definitely let me know in the comments below if you've ever read this book. What did you think? Did you love it as much as I did? Or are you considering reading it? Or have you seen the movie adaptation? What did you think? I definitely want to keep the conversation going in the comments. So let me know your thoughts. I just want to talk about this book 24 seven. So I would love to chat with you about it. If you like this video, please give it a like. I would really, really appreciate it. And subscribe if you haven't already for all my future Donna Tart rants. I would love to have you back for that. And I'll talk to you again next time. Bye.